Good morning, evening, afternoon, night, whenever you're watching this, geographers. Welcome to the Mr. Sin channel. Today's a big day. We're going to be talking about Unit 2, Topic 5. We're going to be going into the demographic transition model. And at the end of this video, we're going to be talking about the epidemiological transition model. These models are really important, not just for this unit, but for the rest of the class. Now, before we dive into these really important concepts, I want to mention my ultimate review packet. I get emails all the time from students asking how they can study better for AP Human Geography. And my ultimate review packet is a great tool for you to use. It comes with videos that'll talk about how to do better on FRQ tests, how to do better on multiple choice, how to study, how to look at some of the themes. It also has summary videos for all of the different units in this class, along with practice quizzes, study guides, answer keys, and two full practice AP tests. And that's just getting started with it. So if you're interested in that, check it out. The link is in the description below. Now the demographic transition model is broken into different stages. Each stage looks at different economic and social developments that happen in a society. Now the first stage of the model is actually where the majority of human history has happened so far. It's defined by low growth. We can actually see that our births here are really high. Remember back to our last video where we were talking about CDR, CBR, NIR? All those concepts come back in this model. And we can see that our births are high and our deaths are also high. Notice too, when we're looking at the model, they actually are essentially the same. So our growth rate then is actually pretty low, hence low growth. It's being canceled out. And the reason why so many people are dying is we don't have medicine yet. People are dying to animal attacks, diseases, you name it, it's killing people. Quite frankly, it's a pretty depressing time to be alive. Now, I do want to stress that all countries today have actually moved on from stage one. There are no countries anymore that are in stage one. Now, an example of a modern day society, not a country that is in stage one, would be the Sentinese people. They're actually living on an island off the coast of India. They have no connection to the outside world. In fact, it's actually illegal to go visit them because they've been isolated for so long that the diseases we have would end up killing the population. Now, countries move from stage one to stage two when either the industrial revolution happens or the medical revolution. Regions like Europe and North America were the first to experience stage two, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, followed by Africa, Asia, and Latin America, thanks to the Medical Revolution. Now, stage two is defined by high growth. When countries enter stage two, they keep their high birth rate. We see that they're still having a lot of babies. That's similar to stage one. However, though, their CDR, their crude death rate, is going down now. The reason why is because of the advancements made in the Industrial Revolution with now food surplus, more efficient production, and also the Medical Revolution where now people are living longer and our infant mortality rate is decreasing. So our births are high and our deaths are now decreasing and this leads to a population boom. You can see that we have a gap. Our births are a lot higher now than our deaths. This leads to our population to start taking off. This is when like Thomas Malthus, for example, looked at what was happening and said, hey, we're going to have a big issue here. He believed that this would just continue. And the demographic transition model actually shows us that, no, he was wrong. At the time, he was in stage two and he didn't see what was going to happen next. Today, we could look at Afghanistan as a great example of actually being a stage two country. Now, eventually, we start to see society change. We start to see more urbanization. We start to see people realize, hey, stage two people, we're having a lot of births and everyone's living. Our kids aren't dying anymore. All of a sudden, now we have some pretty big families. And so we start to see a culture shift. And that's when countries start to enter stage three. For stage three, what we're looking at here is moderate growth. In stage three, women start gaining more opportunities in society. Women are going to school, they're pursuing jobs, careers, and this reduces the amount of time that they have to have families. So our TFR, remember, total fertility rate from the last video, starts to decrease now. Now our family sizes are going down. That with more urbanization, which means the advantages of having large families go away, continue to push that down. So we can see that our births now and deaths are getting closer. We still have a positive NIR where we're growing as a society, but the growth has slowed as now we're becoming more economically developed, but we're also seeing a lot more social opportunities for everyone in society, reducing the amount of time they have for large families. Mexico today would be a great example of a country that has now moved from stage two to stage three as their population growth starts to slow and they're gaining more medical advancements which are allowing people to live longer and we're also seeing more opportunities for citizens which are making it so we're starting to see less large families. Now as countries continue to develop and urbanize and they continue to eliminate gender inequality, we start to see them transition to stage four. 
Here's now where our birth rate and our death rate, our CBR and CDR, are essentially the same again. And this is when a country experiences ZPG. This is zero population growth. Essentially, we've stabilized now. Our NIR is no longer really growing. We're keeping at our status quo. So our population is staying the same here. Now women have lots of opportunities in society. People are now pursuing higher education. And after they graduate college, they might get a master's degree. And from there, a doctorate. And then they have their career. So the amount of time people have for kids is significantly reduced. We start to see the average time that people get married also get pushed back. As now there's other things in life that they're doing. And on top of all that, we continue to see more advancements in medicine, which are allowing people to live longer and longer, which again is going to reduce that family size because that IMR, our infant mortality rate, keeps going down. Today, we could look at the United States and China as great examples of a stage four country. Now, the fifth stage is one that was not originally in the model, and some people actually put the fifth stage with the fourth, but this stage is defined by negative growth. Essentially, what's happening now is society has become so developed and the culture has shifted so much that people's family size is now below that replacement rate, that average TFR of 2.1. So we're now seeing that our births are lower than our death rate. So society now is starting to decrease in population size. Now, there could be other factors as well. There's a variety of different reasons why this might happen. It could be that family sizes are small because of cultural preferences, because of the government, because of urbanization and economic factors, or because now so many people have opportunities in society that they don't want to have as large of families, and they would rather be working or traveling or doing other things with their lives. An example for a possible stage five country could be Japan, where the population now has actually aged and the majority of people are in those post-reproductive years. And the average family family size has dipped below that replacement rate. And so now they're starting to see that they're gonna have an issue because they're not having enough people being born to replace their current population. All right, so those are the main concepts that you need to know for the demographic transition model. And if you need more help with it, check out some of my other videos on the channel that go more in depth into that model. But now we're gonna shift gears and talk about the epidemiologic transition model. This one looks at disease and death. Stage one is defined by pestilence and famine. And here, unfortunately, you're gonna to die to a lot of things. It's not a great time to be alive. It connects pretty closely to our stage one of the demographic transition model. Here you're going to see that we have parasitic diseases and infectious diseases that spread across the land. We're also going to see people dying to animal attacks, running out of food, or just from drinking water that's tainted. We could also see that pandemics and epidemics will impact large swaths of geographic areas. And here your CDR is going to be extremely high. An example actually we could look at would be the bubonic plague. That would fit in stage one of this model. Now, if you're lucky enough to make it out of stage one and move into stage two, you're going to see that the pandemics start to recede. They pull back. We're now seeing advancements in medicine and technology. Remember, stage two of that demographic transition model is when the industrial revolution and that medical revolution occur. And this allows our life expectancy to go up, our infant mortality rate to go down. And now we're getting better at medicine, we're getting new technology, and we're having more access to food. So some of the things that were killing us before are no longer impacting us. However, we're also starting to see more urbanization. And because of that, we're seeing people now living closer together. So we still see that infectious diseases can be a problem as things can spread throughout now these very densely populated areas. And while sanitation was improving, it still wasn't that great. Now, when countries get to stage three of this model, they deal more with degenerative diseases. No longer are they as impacted by infectious diseases. And the reason why is because we're living so long. Now we have more advancements in medicine and technology, which increases our life expectancy. So now people are dealing more with cancer, heart attacks, strokes, diabetes. Some of these are actually kind of human created because of our diet. Society has gained so many options for food and also allows for a more sedentary lifestyle that we start to see people's health actually be negatively impacted. And before we wouldn't see the impacts of this because people didn't live long enough. Today, if we look at a map of the world and we're looking at cancer rates, we can see some parts of the world have very low numbers. It's not that they solved or cured cancer. No, it's they haven't gotten to stage three yet. Their life expectancy isn't that high. So they're not dealing with some of these degenerative diseases yet. Now, when a country gets to stage four, the focus is on delaying degenerative diseases. Here, we're trying to cure cancer 
cancer. We're doing transplants. We're focusing on our lifestyles and how we can live better and healthier lives. Sanitation becomes a big focus. Exercising, reducing the amount of tobacco that's used in society. All these things help us live longer. And this is where medicine continues to improve as we keep trying to push that life expectancy up and those degenerative diseases back. Now, one risk that happens here too, and it's similar to stage three, is because our society is so developed now, more people become sedentary. And so we start to see issues with obesity. And that also has to do with junk food and fast food are very prevalent during this time of society. So it makes it easy to eat unhealthy. Now, the last stage is stage five. And this stage is defined by the reemergence of infectious diseases. This stage doesn't go as well with the demographic transition model, but it's a really important one to understand. Here we see that parasitic and and infectious diseases make a return. And this happens for a variety of reasons. The first reason is that diseases will start to have a resistance to antibiotics. Over time, diseases evolve, and as we continue to use medicine and other environmental threats, they continue to change. And eventually, we could run into things like superbugs, where things like penicillin may no longer be as effective as they once were. And that's when we would have some pretty big issues. Another reason we could see stage five occur is due to increased urbanization. As our cities become larger and larger, they become more densely populated. And as we have more and more people living together, there's a higher chance of diseases spreading throughout. And especially when we look at poverty as well, if we have low-income communities that are tightly packed together, they probably have less access to health care and other medicines that they may need. And so a disease could quickly spread throughout a neighborhood, especially when you have multiple generations of family living in one home. That could create problems and could also then see the reemergence of these infectious diseases. Our last cause could be actually globalization. Today, the world's connected in ways that we've never been connected before. And this leads to people interacting with people all over the world. When we get on airplanes and boats, when we drive our cars, we're interacting with different geographic places. And sometimes we might be exposed to different diseases that our bodies aren't used to. Then when we go back home, we spread it throughout our community. A perfect example of this could actually be COVID-19. COVID-19 spread quickly in densely populated areas. And it spread also through international travel and trade globalization as it went to the major cities around the world. It also impacts people at a lower income more because they have less access to healthcare services. And they're also living in closely packed areas, which allows the disease to spread quickly throughout. All right, that's it for this video. Now, this is really important. I know I say this in all the other videos, but you need to do these practice questions. You can see them on the screen right now. These two models are extremely important for you to understand. So practice what we just went over. I covered a ton of stuff in this video. And when you're done, make sure to check your answers in the comments section below. And if you're still struggling a little bit, check out my ultimate review packet for more resources and help on all these concepts in AP. Thank you so much for spending time with me today and learning about the demographic transition and the epidemiologic transition model. I'm Mr. Sin, and until next time, geographers, I'll see you online. Hey! Hanging out with the end cards I see. Thank you so much again for watching the video. By the way, if you want more Mr. Sin content, don't forget to check me out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can find the links in the description below. Thanks again for watching, geographers, and good luck with your studies. All right, I'm gonna go film 2.6 now, so you guys have a great day.